Well, it's always a privilege and an honor to be able to share with you uh, from God's Word. And again, we want to be mindful of Pastor Tim as he's away and look forward to uh, hearing all the good things God's done in Africa this week. Um, But, you know, and we've mentioned several times this morning, there's a lot going on mission-wise out of the life of our church. And, you know, we mentioned Jeff Dalton just got back from Guatemala and the all the teams that are currently out there uh, in transit or in, in the field as we speak. Uh, we got Romania coming up in, in October. And that's a pretty big deal. But on top of that, there's just the everyday getting up and living Jesus in just our life. And I'm going to tell you, and we talked about this in my Sunday school class this morning, most days than not, it takes maximum effort for that to happen in my life, you know, just to be honest about it. Um, y'all don't mind if we're a little honest this morning, do you? Y'all won't tell anybody if I confess any sins, do you? But sometimes it's just, it takes maximum effort. It takes a lot of work. It's not always easy. You don't always wake up thirsty for the Word. You know, a lot of days we do, don't we? I mean, a lot of days we're, we can't wait to hear and see what God's going to reveal to us in the Scripture. We can't wait to spend, but a lot of days it it always ain't that way. Sometimes it's a little bit, a little bit like kind of wading through cement. Is that just me? Am I the only sinner in here this morning? I knew it. I knew it. it well, y'all pray for me then, okay? I'll, but it, it, that's just on. So when we think about the, you know, the work of God going on as an extension of our church in all, you know, these exotic places, Istanbul, you know, Tanzania, Romania. New Orleans even. I've been to New Orleans. It's a foreign country down there. I went to New Orleans when I wasn't a preacher. I'll just say it that way. I went as a musician. And I saw some things I can't unsee. I'll just leave it that way. So pray for our kids as they're down there working in New Orleans this week. But we're still cognizant of the fact that we have a mission field. When we, The minute... Look, when, when I set my feet on the floor every morning, I'm in a mission field because I'm trying to, to live the gospel out in front of my kids, right? I want them to know the truth, and I want them to know the joy of the grace of God in their lives. When we step out our front door to the left, right, and across the street, there's lost folks living around me. You know, you go to Walmart, there are lots of lost folks at Walmart. I don't want to be judgy, but they're there, <laughs> You know, and the mission is real, and none of that happens by accident. It takes something supernatural for this message of the cross that we sang about, for this power that is in the blood of Christ to come out of these broken vessels, these jars of clay, and to transform lives. It takes something beyond us, right? So if the kids in New Orleans this week are going to be effective at all for the kingdom, it's going to be because the power of God is at work in them. And if we're going to be effective in our homes or at Walmart or wherever we find our, in your business or you know, wherever you find yourself in your mission field, if we're going to be effective there, it's going to be because the power of God is at work within. It's not only because of anything we do in our humanity. Lord, have mercy. That's the impediment to the gospel. And it's the power of God that helps us overcome that. And in his letter to the church at Ephesus, which is a church Paul founded, he, uh, he speaks of a prayer for power for these people in this church the Ephesian church. And I want to look at that. this morning. you have your Bibles with you, um, there, I didn't put this in the outline, and it's not, it's not our primary text. Our primary text is Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. There's another prayer that he records in Ephesians 1. And I didn't have time in the two and a half hours I have with you this morning, I didn't have time to... Y'all you know, don't leave. That's a joke. I didn't have... We simply didn't have time to pick all of that apart, but I want to read 
that prayer from Ephesians 1 as well, and that's Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. And here's what's going on. Many of you have studied, you've been through studies of Ephesians. You know, Ephesians is one of those great books because it's divided up real neatly. Um, you've, there's six chapters. The first three chapters are all about the what of the gospel, okay? We get the what of the gospel in those first three chapters. Um, and then we get in the last three chapters the how. How do we live this out? How does that work itself out in our lives? And kind of tucked in the middle of there, kind of at the turning point, Paul offers this prayer in Ephesians 3. Um, but he starts that prayer all the way back in the beginning of the letter. So let, I just want to read that quickly, and then we'll go over and, and read our, our primary thing in Ephesians 3. So Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15. For this reason. Well, what is the reason? Well, just quickly, he's already talked about the grace of God, the redemption that we have through Christ, the hope that we have in Christ, and he's already kind of expounded on those things in the opening of this letter. And he gets down to verse 15, he says, it's for these reasons, for this reason, this hope we have in Christ, the redemption and the grace of God at work in you, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all, and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that, God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Get that, that what he's praying for when he said, if there's going to be any spirit and revelation coming to you, the purpose is intimacy with God. Okay? It's not self-promotion. It's not self-aggrandizing. It is the purpose of this supernatural revelation of who God is and what he has done is so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incom incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So Paul's already he's, he's set the groundwork about this idea of power in the life of the believer. And he said, the, the power that I'm praying that will be at work in you for the purpose of proclaiming the grace and the redemption and the hope so that you might know God better, the power that I'm praying for you, it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And that's the power that we're praying that those teenagers and those adults will have in New Orleans this week that they will work in the power that raised Christ from the dead as they share the gospel. It's the power that, that we pray that Pastor Tim will minister in this week in Tanzania. It's the power that we prayed for Jeff in Guatemala last week. It's the power that we're praying Maggie will work in as she's doing her mission work in Istanbul. It's the power that we pray for the team that will be heading to Romania, that as you're there working and sharing and sharing the love of Christ and the love of God and sharing the gospel, that you're working in the very power that raised Christ from the dead. I was waiting for the amen. It didn't come. Okay, all right, we'll, I'm sorry. We'll keep pressing on. I even had it in my notes. Pause for amen right there. I, I didn't. I didn't. All right. So then, then Paul goes on to write. He keeps writing in this letter. In chapter 2, he writes about we're made alive in Christ. He talks about being saved by grace through faith, about the reconciliation, the bringing together of the Jews and the Gentiles to create this new church. He talks about peace with God through the Spirit of God and being brought near. Again, this idea of intimacy with God, knowing God better, being intimate with him and then he begins chapter three and he talks about this mystery of who christ is being revealed in in what he calls the latter times there he said well, it kind of been hidden but now i'm here to proclaim this mystery of christ and that his mission 
was to preach this gospel of Christ to the Gentiles so that all of God's people might be brought together in one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And then he gets to this prayer. And again, he uses these words. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, he says, for this reason. What are the reasons? All the stuff we just said, okay? For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. He's going to use that word a couple more times in this, in this passage. Power. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. We're going to circle back to that in a minute, okay? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And Paul is praying that this power that he spoke about from the very opening of his letter to this church would be made manifest in their lives. So what is power? It's a, you know, it begs the question. So I sent, I put a little thing on Facebook this week asking folks if they had kids under 12 to define what power was. And these are some of the responses we got. Uh, Raleigh, this is Craig Newton's daughter, says, it means you're charging. So I guess their phones go dead and go, we've got to power my phone up and plug it in. But Raleigh, she's three, she thinks that if you've got power, you're charging something. Uh, Isabella says it's strength. I think that's good. Um, Mia said, you have the power of taking care of me. I guess she was talking to, uh, uh, I think Janet sent that to me, so maybe Grandma was telling, no, or did Mama send that to me? Kristen sent that to me. So she was telling Kristen, you've got the power to take, but I'm going to tell you, I got, I got a kid her age. It takes power, okay? Let's just be honest. Emma says, to be able to lift heavy stuff. All right, let's just cut through it. That's what power is, the ability to lift heavy stuff, all right? Um, Levi said to attack something. We see that power on display in our home on an hourly basis. And the, he's usually unleashing that power on his brother. Sophie said lamps can turn on with it, right? That makes sense. Dallas says energy stuff has... I, I buy it. And Bain says superpowers. I like that. Now, uh, Jessica's oldest child also sent me a response. I couldn't get the, the animated GIF of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe to play, but uh, that's what Daniel said power was. But then things kind of started getting, I mean, they really started honing in. These are some of our older kids. Ava said, when someone can tell you what they want, and when they want it, like a king has power over his kingdom. So we're thinking about in terms power in terms of authority. I thought that was pretty good, right? Noah said command over something. And then Madeline said the ability to do something. And that's really, when we start talking about power, all of that stuff kind of comes into play, all of them. Even vain superheroes. I mean, it all comes in there, something that is beyond our ability to really comprehend on some levels. You may have heard in sermons somewhere down the pike, uh, word studies done on this word power, and there, there are different Greek words that are translated power, and I'm not going to get bogged down in all that, because at the end of the day, they kind of all land in a very similar spot. But the idea of power is the the ability and the capability of getting something done, okay? And what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus 
and now by extension to the church at North Clay, is that God's power will be at work in us to get something done. And that something is all the stuff that he said, for this reason I bow my knee, that we would proclaim the truths of the gospel of grace and redemption and hope and be made alive in Christ and reconciliation and nearness and intimacy with God and the mission to preach this gospel. In this prayer in Ephesians 3, there are two petitions that he makes that have two purposes. The first petition here, the petitions for for power, the first one is to be strengthened in our inner being. He says, I pray... Where where did it go? Verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being. That sounds awfully hocus-pocus to some folks, right? What is inner being? It's the part that doesn't die. That's what he's saying. Because this stuff, this is weak, right? And it's getting weaker by the moment. The longer you live, the weaker it gets. And that's the reality of life. And what Paul is praying is that the power to unfold the gospel will not be tied to this. That we can take this out of the equation because he's praying that we'll be strengthened through the inner being. The part that doesn't die. The part that doesn't get weak. And we all find ourselves on different places in that spectrum. You know, some of you got lots of, lots of miles left in your outward man. You know, I'm, I'm not that old of a model, but I'm pretty high mileage. But some of us have a lot, lot left. But some of us, you know, warranties up. But that doesn't mean that the mission is any less relevant to those of us who are struggling with the the decaying of our flesh than it is to those who are young and vibrant in their outer man because it is the power of God at work through His Spirit on the inside that is enabling us to do the work of the ministry. My mom, well into her late 80s, early 90s, was not able, she couldn't drive, she was blind in one eye, literally, couldn't see, couldn't, couldn't drive, couldn't get out of the house, what we would term in church parlance as a shut-in, but she had a chair. I have that chair now. My kids use it as a trampoline. I yell at him for it, so don't, you know. And it was her prayer chair. I'd go see her and say, Mom, what you been doing? I've been sitting in my prayer chair. What you been doing over there? Praying. That was not the brightest kid, you know, of the five. But that was her ministry. She couldn't get out and visit. She used to like to bake cakes and so she couldn't even do that much towards the end. But what she could do was sit there and unleash the power of God in her inner being for the cause of the gospel. See? So Paul's first petition is that we be strengthened in our inner being. He told the church at Corinth this in 2 Corinthians. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. All right? That's what we've been talking about. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. That's the beauty of the power of God at work. It's not tied to the outward wasting away. It exists despite the outward wasting away. For our light and momentary troubles. And it, some of you read that and you go, I'm not sure, Paul, that they're, neither, that they're either light nor momentary. But listen, in view of the power that is at work within us and the glory that lies ahead of us, even if these troubles last 70, 80, 90, 100 years, they're light and they're momentary because there's an eternity of the glory of God waiting at the end of the journey, which is really just the beginning of the journey. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not this stuff, but on what is unseen. 
substance. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The inner man, the power of God at work on the inside, because that's where eternity is happening. That's where the saved of God will worship for eternity. It's where the condemned will suffer for eternity, but eternity exists for all of us. So while those kids are tooling down the highway towards New Orleans, our prayer is that eternity will be working through them in New Orleans this week. All right? To be strengthened in their inner being. He told the church at Rome this. He said, I find this law at work. Paul again, being brutally honest. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Again, am I the only one that experiences that? On a daily, I, I told my Sunday school class, I, I experienced that 10 really good times getting my family to church on time on Sunday morning, right? I'm sending, I'm sending good getting out the door, doing the countdown. We got five minutes in the car. I want to do good, but evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. So Paul's praying that we'll be strengthened from the inside out. The second petition is this, that we may comprehend the greatness of his love. Okay? He prays that here. Where, where is that? Uh, I got it. And I pray, this is kind of at the end of verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints, there's the word power again, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Not just that we'll be strengthened from the inside, but it's going to take that power to get to the second thing, We can't understand and comprehend the greatness of the love of God without that power from the inside. But he wants the revelation of the love of God to be made evident and manifest in the life of the people of the church at Ephesus. And again, I believe because it's recorded for us here in Scripture that it applies to us as well. The desire of God is that we comprehend his greatness and the greatness of his love. Even when we can't see it. Again, maybe there are some of you that wake up some mornings and go, I don't particularly feel loved today. Or maybe I know my kids love me and perhaps I might understand my spouse loves me. But they don't know what I think about sometimes or how I feel. And God knows all that stuff. How can he possibly love me? And when we look at it from a human perspective, it does. it's kind of a, Kind of a crisis, a little bit, right? But that's why Paul's praying that we will have power, the ability, the supernatural ability to understand the greatness greatness of his love. Because we can't fully understand the greatness of his love strictly from a human perspective. Because the only experience we have with love as humans is faulty. It's skewed. That's not saying it's not real. I love my wife. She's hot, y'all. She's beautiful. Can I say my wife is hot in church? I just did. But it's the truth. I love her. I love her with all my heart. I have since the moment I laid eyes on her. 18 years old, she was, not me. And I've loved her ever since. Haven't always been a great husband, hadn't always been a good friend. But I've always loved her. But it's because I haven't always been a great husband, haven't always been a great friend, that this idea of human love is skewed because it allows for mistakes. I love my kids. Guys, y'all are parents, you know. You know what a parental love is like. I wouldn't take one bullet. I'd take them all for my kids. Lay my life down without thinking. Sometimes I get mad at those little monsters. You know, that human love is skewed. So it takes supernatural understanding to get a hold of the fact that God 
fully aware of our sinfulness, loves us. Okay? That we may comprehend the greatness of God's love. He explained the greatness of God's love to the church at Rome this way. He said, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. Ungodly. That means not godlike, in case you were wondering. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that blows the mind of people on the outside looking in. People on the inside looking in almost can't get their mind. I struggle with getting my mind around that concept. That a holy righteous God who is infinitely holy and infinitely righteous and infinitely different than me loves me knowing what I am and who I am. Jesus told Nicodemus, he explained God's love this way. He said, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. Same thing that Paul told the church at Rome there. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It takes a supernatural understanding to get to that, okay? But there's a purpose in these petitions. He didn't just say, I'm praying for this, and I, and I hope it happens, so that you'll have warm fuzzies. There's a purpose to these petitions. He says, I pray that you'll be strengthened in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. That's the purpose of the power to be strengthened in our inner being. So that Christ may take up residence in us. And that has a couple of meanings. One is that he'll take up residence in us, that we will be born again. And that's part of his prayer to the church at Ephesus. I pray that his power that will strengthen you in your inner man because you're not going to get this idea of redemption unless you're strengthened on the inside. It's not going to happen. And I pray that that happens so that Christ may dwell in you. All right? And also that Christ may dwell among you, church at Ephesus. So that as we are strengthened from the inside out, that Christ is more and more and more at home at North Clay Baptist Church. He doesn't live in these four walls. He doesn't, he's not constrained and, or contained to this building, unlike our cell signals. They can't get in or out. But Christ is not constrained that way. you know. So we call this God's house, but... His mail may come here, but he's everywhere. We get that. But when we talk about him dwelling among his people, we're talking about the very real sense that as we're strengthened in our inner being, that he takes up residence first in us, renewing us and conforming us to the image of his Son. But then he dwells among us as his people. So that when folks do come to us, or when we do go to them out there, which is the model that the gospel presents for us, right? That they're aware that Christ is dwelling among his people. That it's evident that Christ has taken up residence at North Clay Baptist Church because they're being strengthened. We are being strengthened through our inner man. Again, Paul writing to the church at Galatia said that I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, it's not my life anymore. I've been strengthened by, by the power of God through my inner being, and now Christ dwells in me. It's not my life, it's his life. Colossians 1, 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The 
purpose of the petition to be strengthened in our inner being is so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. That's exactly what the text says. And then secondly, the second purpose of the, sec- of the second petition here, that we may comprehend the greatness of God's love so that we may be filled with the fullness of God. We can't understand being filled to the measure with the fullness of God correctly apart from understanding the vastness of the love of God. Because what happens if we're not filtering that through the petition of understanding the love of God and we only get to being filled with the measure of the fullness of God, we go to crazy places. That what God is doing, He's doing because He's in, you know, indebted to us in some way. Like our brothers on television like to say, that God owes us something because of this covenant we're in. No, 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 no. God loves us, and because He loves us, He strengthens us in our inner being so that we can have Him dwell among us. And then that power helps us comprehend the greatness of His love so that all of Him may permeate all of us. All right? Filled to the measure. What does that mean? It means filled to the measure. Filled up. I like to cook shouldn't come as a shock because it's obvious. I like to eat. But I grew up in the kitchen. I grew up, my mom was a a cook. She was one of those, uh, you know, my mom was born in 1920. She was raised in the the Depression. So she was a a Depression-era cook, which meant she got creative. So you didn't always have what the recipe called for. And that's how I learned to cook. Pinch of this, dash of that, glob of this, a little bit of that. I can't tell you how I make anything. Let's go in there and find what's in there, and we put it together and we eat it. And most of the time, it's pretty good. Right? Drives Karen crazy because Karen likes recipes. And she's really good at them. Any of you ever had her chocolate cake, you won't buy another store-bought cake. Okay? It's good. But when she measures, she measures to, she fills it to the measure. Right? You know, if it says a cup, you get the cup thing out, and you fill it up. Not a little less than a cup, a cup, right? Filled to the measure means it is full to the measure. Nothing else is going in there. Filled to the measure with the fullness of God. All of who He is permeating all of who we are. Now understand, There's a lot of the nature of God that is beyond the comprehension, much less the acquisition of our humanity. Trapped in this, there will come a day standing before him we behold his glory with unveiled faces. But the promise is still all of him permeating all of us purpose of the power, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we may be filled with the fullness of God. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, when he starts transitioning over into that, here's how this lives out, kind of plays out in your life kind of thing, Paul writes, so Christ himself gave the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal. That every area of my life, every dark corner of me, is illuminated by every good thing that He is. Where does this power come from? It ought to be obvious by now. It comes from God's glorious riches. That's what he says. I pray that out of his glorious riches you may be strengthened. The glorious riches of God. Here's what we know about the glorious riches of God. They're extravagant. They're glorious. 
and their riches, meaning they're valuable. Paul told the church at Philippi that he said, my God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Whatever those needs were, he was talking specifically there about, they, he was talking about money because they were, had taken up money to send them. If you read the rest of the letter, you know. He says, my God shall supply all of your need. The greatest need of humanity is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that happens out of the riches of his glory. So the source of the power is the glorious riches of God. But he also says that there is a way that this power is unleashed through the unity of his people. And I'm not, I don't fully understand how that works, but I know that it does. Because when God's people are functioning in unity, we see some pretty amazing things happen in the body of Christ. I tell you this, when there is envy and strife among the people of God, we're guaranteed not to see amazing things happen in the body of Christ. That's why he said there, again, in Ephesians 4, he said, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. So whatever it takes to strive together in unity, do that. And that's hard. Again, folks, that takes maximum, maximum effort because we're people. We're flawed. We don't always get along. I don't always like what you do. You rarely like what everybody does all the time. But we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called with one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I don't know how it works, but somehow the power of God is expelled through his people when we strive together in unity. What's the purpose in all this? What, what's the end game in all this? What's the point in all of that? What's the result of this power? To increase our effectiveness for the kingdom. That's what he's praying for the church at Ephesus they would be effective in living out this gospel of reconciliation and redemption. We pray for this power of God to be unleashed in our lives for that purpose. Not to build some kind of human kingdom, but to build the kingdom of God. To increase our effectiveness for the kingdom. That's one of the last things Jesus told his disciples before he went back to heaven. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Because you'll be strengthened. You'll be equipped. You'll be charging for the purpose of the kingdom. And ultimately, ultimately is with everything that happens, in the kingdom of God and outside of the kingdom of God. The result of this power is that God is glorified. When he's put on display by demonstrating his love, by proclaiming the good news, by showing who he is and what he has done, God is glorified. And that's the end game. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And let this message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It's for His glory. And my prayer is that you would be strengthened from the inside out for the purpose of understanding the vastness of his love for you and his love for those out there and that we would be equipped and empowered to share that good news every day in every way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of 
sharing together this time this morning. And I pray, Lord, that your word would take root deep in us and bring forth the fruit of righteousness among us. And I pray, Lord, just as Paul did, that we would be strengthened in our inner beings and that we would have power to comprehend together with all the saints how high and long and deep and wide is the love of God, that we might be willing and compelled to share that good news every step we take and every day we live. Lord, we turn now to a moment of decision. And I pray that as you're moving among your people every day, even at this moment, at this minute, in this hour, Lord, if there's anyone in the room that doesn't know you, I pray that you would begin to stir in their hearts now to draw them to you, that they might experience this great overwhelming love that you have for us. Or whatever the need, I pray that they would be aware of your presence and again they would know the comfort of your presence and your spirit this morning. Lord, come and move among your people. Draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen.